Um, we finished our series on Acts last week. Um, we had a, like an overview really of the book over the last what, six to eight weeks. Um, and now I just thought that we would take our time in terms of preparing for Easter. I know Easter might seem a long way off, but I don't know about you, but for me, when we get to these Christian festivals, they seem a long way off. And then all of a sudden within the last mm. two weeks leading up to them, they seem to speed up. Life gets busier. Mm. Church life gets busier. And so often we go through these seasons or I've gone through these seasons and I've looked back and thought, did I really get the most from that? So hopefully by just pausing and starting to reflect and prepare well in advance, by the time that we do actually experience this, this wonderful um, celebration of Easter, we can really say that we've gained a lot from it. We've been blessed by it and we've gained a, a greater understanding of, of what it's all about. And just really grateful to John, who's going to take us through the Last Supper this evening, something very much looking forward to. And we're just grateful in advance of what you're going to bring, John. So before we start, we, oh, really? we just before we start, we'd just like to um, just pause, just steady our minds and our hearts, and uh, just commit this evening to God in prayer. So let us just pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity to fellowship with each other. Lord, we thank you for each other. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for this celebration of Easter that we're going to start looking at over this next couple of weeks. Lord, just please still our hearts and our minds as we just pause now. So that, Father, we may be prepared to receive what you have in store for us this evening. And Lord, may you bless your servant John as he brings your word through to us tonight. Lord, we commit these things in your dear name's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Hi there. Um, did you all um, read the message in the email? That Mark sent out about having communion. This evening. Yeah. All, yeah. You all got communion ready for this evening. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 26. And I'm going to read from seven, verse 17 to 29. Matthew 26, 17 to 29. <laughs> Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Passover, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, you have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, for this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So here we have this wonderful picture of Jesus and his disciples in this in this room which was prepared for them. And when I was looking, looking at it, in Luke 22, I think, verse 10, 
it says that he told them to find a man in the city carrying a pitcher of water and follow him. Um, and we might just read that line and go, oh, yeah, right. You know, that's easy to do. That's a good command. But apparently in that culture, in those days, men did not carry pitchers of water. Only women did. Is that right, Malcolm, do you think? Yeah, I would have thought so. Yeah. So that was quite an unusual thing to happen. You know, did Jesus prepare this man to say, you need to carry this pitcher of water so my disciples can recognize you? I don't know. Um, but that was quite while I was researching, that was quite a, an, an incidental thing, which I thought was quite uh, important. So anyway, um, before I go on, let me ask a question for everybody. What do you think is the meaning of the Last Supper? In what respect, John? In, in a spiritual respect? In a, uh, in, in a physical respect? Well, both. In, in a historical sense, as in the Passover meal? Yeah, you know, what, what, well, they were, they were celebrating the Passover, but then Jesus instigated the Last Supper. So what do we think is the meaning of this Last Supper? It's obviously foreshadowing his, his death, because obviously he shows that the bread is his body, the blood is his, the, the, the wine is his blood. Um, but I suppose the sense of last is the last on earth. Obviously, he says, I'll eat it with you again in the kingdom with my yeah. father. So it's really the last moment of fellowship with his disciples on earth after yes. three years with them. Yeah, absolutely. This, this was the last time they were meeting together before his death. Um, yes, which, which had great significance. And it was just a bit of a... A pity in a way that they didn't realize that at the time i think they fully only realized it after he ascended to heaven but for him it was um incredibly um important um life-changing obviously emotional you know all these different feelings that he would have had going through his mind so um but he presents the new covenant to them doesn't he Yes, exactly. Yeah, the new covenant, which is what we celebrate today. Yes, you're right there, Jeff. Absolutely. Um, okay. And it was quite, it was amazing that it was established then. I think it's also worth noting that, that it, it more than likely wasn't considered by the disciples at that time to be the Last Supper. It was called the Last Supper after the fact. Yeah. Um, the, at, at that point, it was just supper. They were having the they were having the Passover. They were having the Passover meal that they did as a tradition every Passover. Yes. And Jesus, um, obviously, he knew what was about to happen, and he was trying to explain, or not trying to, because that in, that sort of denotes that that he might not have been successful. He was explaining it to the disciples what was going <clears throat> to happen and the significance of it, but but some of them really struggled to comprehend what he was what he was saying what he was doing with absolutely that. absolutely you know and you the know, word yeah. last is a powerful one isn't it if you think of it because it's a yeah. reminder to all of us that we shouldn't presume on anything um that we never know what is the last yeah. um and that sense of you know well the song i wish we'd all be ready it's that sense of um knowing that we are ready isn't it and at all times, which is a powerful reminder yeah. uh, that none of them knew. <laughs> I, yes. I, wonder, I wonder how much Jesus was thinking of that first Passover that Moses instigated. I wonder from scripture how much he was thinking about that. Mm. Yes, you mean for himself, because, you know, they, they had to sacrifice a lamb, didn't they? and spread his blood over the door lintel. Mm. And so was he thinking of it in that way, that he was the sacrificial lamb? Was Jesus was thinking so that? Then, yeah. He was so sure then that he was going to um, only drink wine again when he, in, his, in his kingdom. Yeah. And he's actually given us the insurance that there is a heaven to come still. 
Yes. Yeah. So this was his last of physical act with them about eating and, and drinking and saying, this is my blood who spilt for you for the remission of sins and that he wasn't going to drink it again until they met with him in the kingdom of God. Um, so, yeah, that's you know. so all these things, all these pointers were incredibly important at that time. Um, but the disciples didn't really, really understand what he was saying. But Jesus, um, on his time with us, um, established two full commands for every one of us to follow. One was baptism after repent repentance, after we publicly acknowledge him as our Lord and Saviour. And the second is communion, where we acknowledge his death and resurrection, um, atoning for all our sins. And without his atoning death and resurrection, we have no part of him, he said. If, if someone can just quickly for me, please read John 6, verse 53. John 6, verse 53. I'm happy to do that, John. Thank you, Tim. I think I'm just about there. Okay. Here we go. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you can eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Yes. So we, when we meet together and we take communion, we have to do this because it's a command from Jesus. Jesus tells us that we must do this whenever we meet together and it's what amazes me is that when we, I, I personally love when we have communion in church I just love the whole thing of it the whole sequence of it um because it's part of our worship and um it never ceases to amaze me that when we take the bread and wine um my immediate thought goes right to Jesus straight away um of how he came into my life and what happened, what's happened since that time. Mm. And I'm, at, you know, forever eternally grateful um, that I found him and that I realized who he was and how real he is in my life. And taking communion reaffirms my faith, if that makes sense. It's like reaffirming why I did what I did, how, why I stood by my bed and gave my life to Jesus and said, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Um, and how that is always at the forefront of my mind when we take communion. Um, and that's why I think it's so important. And I'm sure all of us have different uh, memories or, or pictures in our mind of when we take communion. Um, but that's, that's, that's what I think of every time we take it. So, of course, it is incredibly important. And the more often we do it, the better I like it. Now, the bread, of course, symbolizes his body broken for us. And the wine or juice, whatever we drink, symbolizes his blood poured out for our sins. And by following the, this command, we proclaim what Jesus did for each and every one of us. So as we take part in the communion, we are reminded of all what Jesus did and how difficult it was for him. Hmm. So let me, let me ask a question. How do, how do we understand, or can we understand? I, we, we talked a little bit about this this morning in the Bible study in church, but how difficult it was for Jesus as a human and God to be able to process what he was going to do, knowing full well that taking this Last Supper with his disciples was the beginning of him going to his death so let's discuss this a minute if we can of how we think what jesus might have felt there must have been the element of what he, he says in the garden of gethsemane where mm. he the cry is lord if it was possible if there's another way uh, let this cup pass from me so that sent that has to be very real doesn't it for him as a human yeah uh, the yeah. You know, the, the price was a very high price, and mm. to carry that meant um, laying down his life, and nobody, nobody easily takes that decision. I mean, we look at it because of what it means, but we can't pass over lightly what it meant for him as a 33-year-old young man. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely, Malcolm. Yeah, um, it's it's quite easy to forget, isn't isn't it, that he was human as well as God, and um, and he was going through all these incredible emotions, which any of us would be going through if we were faced with an ultimatum of of a health issue or whatever it would be. Um, and yet Jesus, as, as, as Mark and I and the others discussed this morning, Jesus said, but not my will, your will be done. And uh, so how quickly he turned that around. Um, but yeah, it must have been incredibly difficult for him. So here he was seated with all his disciples and with all these thoughts going in his mind. And yet he still showed them his love, um, you know, sharing this meal with them and showing that he was, although he was their, their saviour, he was also their servant. And that's incredibly humbling what he was doing. So when we meditate on all these things that Jesus did for us, does it enhance, does it enhance us and grows our faith? Yeah. I, I, I don't think it, I don't think we can not be uh, challenged in our faith and grown in our faith when we when we read this. So we were talking this morning and I was saying that the it just struck me that the, the duality of Jesus, the, you know, he's 100 percent God and he was 100 percent man. And we, and we know that. And talking about it in the garden where he said uh, in, in, in his humanity, if it's possible let this cup pass from me then in his godliness yet not my will but yours not not my will flesh your will your will god be done because he was both yeah so so if you think about it he's saying not my will but my will be done because he's god so so he so he's denying the flesh and and he's pursuing the uh the the deity of 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 god and that that really is something that's um quite fascinating to try and uh, comprehend really and, and and for me to see jesus here with his disciples he knows although they might struggle to comprehend it he knows exactly what he's facing the next day he knows what's coming he knows every strike every thorn every whip mark every nail he knows the faces of the soldiers who are going to nail him to the cross in, you know in his, in his godliness he knows all of this he knows exactly what's about to happen yet still he looks at his disciples and through that he looks at us through the words of scripture he looks at us and he says i'm doing this for you because i love you and that I mean, can you imagine what the disciples must have felt afterwards when they looked back and saw and realized what Jesus was saying and what he was doing at that point? Yeah. yeah. And even Judas, I mean, well, we all know what happened to, to Judas. It drove him to, to take his own life because he couldn't cope with the, um, you know, what he'd done, his, his betrayal of the, of the, of the son of man. It, it, it's, it's remarkable and and i it is i i think easter for me good friday i love absolutely love preaching on good friday i love i love easter sunday of course that's a great celebration um but it, for me personally i just love looking at the cross and and what happened there in in that the emotion and the um the the j just jesus set in his face and 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 going knowing what's coming but still taking it on is... there's an enigma with it isn't there as well yeah. though that whilst we do know that jesus knew what he faced the question of how much he knew is a question i think because clearly in his humanity he lived fully as a man which meant that he he laid aside a huge amount of, of his deity you know we we, we yeah. say that don't we because we know that jesus is a little boy is a little boy 
He's not yeah. walking around yeah, performing course. miracles with his yeah. toys. <laughs> he's a little boy. And at the point where he's baptized by John and the spirit comes upon him, then that becomes the moment of the com commencement of his ministry. But there has to be a question still, doesn't there, as to even here, how much did he, does he know? Because the very fact that he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, that's his humanity. So he knows he's got to die, but I, I think there is a, it, it is a real mystery, isn't it? How his mm. humanity is very much at the heart of what happens um, mm. and, and the price he pays. So he knows it has to happen, that he has to die. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, exactly what he knew and when he knew it is quite a mystery. I guess we'll have to find out one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this much we do know when he's on the cross, he turns to the thief, doesn't he? And say, today, you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. Um, for, for, so he, knew, me, he knew that much. For me now, that raises the question that I've never actually thought about before, and may, maybe others have. Was Jesus, during his ministry, after, after the Holy Spirit came, and the father spoke from heaven. Was he omniscient? We I, know I don't think he was, Mark. I think no. part of no. this is Philippians 2, isn't it? Um, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God something to something be grasped, to grasp, but yeah. emptied himself, literally yeah. emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and then being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, mm. obedient unto death, death on the cross. Yeah. So I think that emptying. Mm. is a crucial element yeah he's, he is god but he's no he's not walking around thinking god's thoughts yeah he's walk, yeah. walking around as the man who has taken on well the the, the, the son of god who's taken on humanity and has in that yeah. sense laid aside yeah. his yeah. deity so so then the the sorry i'm, I'm really fascinated by this and i'm, I'm just I, i'm i'm this is great so then the miracles jesus performed is he performing them through the power of the holy spirit yeah i think yeah. so yeah yeah very yeah. very i think very much that way i think it is the holy spirit that, that enables him to fulfill mm. what he's called to do otherwise you end up with um him pretending to be human yes yeah you're right yeah. he doesn't pretend right. he's fully yeah. like yeah. you and me if he's not like you and me then he's no example to us yeah 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 Wow. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I've just looked at that whole thing. I don't, isn't it amazing how you can just look at something in a new way? Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. just like a, it's just jumped out at me. Fantastic. Like a light bulb moment. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I go on? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep quiet. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. But when we take when we take communion, uh, we are also reminded on how much Jesus loves us, mm. and that He blesses us as one of His own. You know, we belong to Him. I mean, just as me saying that, I'm getting shivers up and down my spine, knowing that He loves me so much, and that He blesses us all the time. And taking communion uh, reminds us of that. Yes, we can be reminded of that in other ways, but I think it's when we take communion, when we take the bread and the wine, the symbolism of it all, it's, uh, it's a powerful thing, I think. I hope I'm not the only one that thinks that about taking communion. So we probably discussed this already, but why do you think the Last Supper was so important? You mean the original one or for us, John? Sorry? You mean the original supper or for us? Uh, for, for us. No, well, yeah. Why was the Last Supper then so important? Why, why was it important? It, it, it instituted uh, um, the, the yeah. covenant, didn't it? It instituted a promise from God. Yes. 
it was it was a it was a seal of something and uh, you know it, it was jesus saying this is this is what i'm doing for you i mean uh, he, yes i mean go, going back to that time when they were together they could have just had the meal and jesus could have just explained to them why they were all eating what was going to happen hold on sorry my carers have just not my carers jean's carers <laughs> yeah, there's worry for a moment there, John. <laughs> You're gonna watch him give John his dinner. <laughs> it's um, I, th I think, think thinking well, of um, Mark, thinking of the the point we were discussing a moment ago. I was thinking of that um, message. I was just thinking, John, of what we were saying earlier. Um, just while you were out, really, um, that when Jesus spoke about the things he did in John 14, he says, the works I do, you will do also. Mm. And greater works than these you will do because I go to the Father. So we're called. It's amazing to think, isn't it, that we as human beings are called to do what he, as a human being, filled with the Spirit, yeah. was doing. Yeah. Because he could do them by the Spirit, so can we. Yeah, yeah. Was, was that greater... When he said greater things than these will, will will you do, was that greater number wise or was that greater better? Not much more you can do by raising the dead other than raising. <laughs> 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 I think it has to be the spread, doesn't it? Greater because of the expanse of it and the, yeah, I think so, yeah. Not the limits geographically that Jesus yeah. had. Mm. And nationally, the so nation at that time, the Holy Spirit was only in Jesus, yeah, not anyone else. And and right. and so, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, it just you know went crazy. Hmm. But yes, going back to that question about why we think the Last Supper was important, uh, as I said, they could have just had the meal and he could have just explained to them what was going to happen without the symbolism of the bread and wine and and. That would have been, I don't know what, what would have happened from that, but the very fact that we take communion today and have done for the last cent how many centuries um, puts Jesus at the forefront again when we realise what he did for us mm. um, and why the, the bread and the, and the wine are so symbolic about his body and, and, and blood that, that this... That he had to sacrifice himself um, for each and every one of us. Um, can somebody quickly read, please, Matthew 16, 21 to 23? I'll, I'll read it. I don't mind. Thank you very much, Sam. No problem. Uh, Matthew 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of his elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day to be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned. Jesus turned. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it again. What good will it be for a man if he gains his whole, the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and there will be reward for each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man come in, in his kingdom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, it's quite difficult. We have here like a picture of even Peter of not realising fully what Jesus was saying to them. 
And so he was trying to say to Jesus, no, no, this is not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And Jesus rebuked him um, for his not understanding of why Jesus had to die. But also at this time, he knew that their lives were going to be ripped apart because of what was going to happen to him. And so then he goes on um, to say that the last thing he was telling them to do was that they must love each other because he knew he wasn't going to be with them. So when he tells them this, he comforts them and he confirms to them again who he is. And something else happens. For the first time ever, he calls them his friends. And then, of course, he announces the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the fact that he calls them friends was quite a, love, a lovely thing. He was outwardly showing his love for each and every one of them by saying these things. And then also at the Last Supper, he prays for himself. So can I ask, um, Jeff, can you read, please, John 17, verses 1 to 5? When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his, up, up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify that son, that the son may glorify thee. Since thou hast given him power over all, all flesh, to give eternal life to all them thou hast given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I glorify thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me in my own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world was made. I have manifested thy name to the, to the men whom thou gavest me out of the, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them to me. Now they have kept thy word. Now they know that everything that thou hast given me is from thee. Thank you very much. Tim, can I ask you to please read John 17, 6 to 19? This is when he prays for his disciples. Yes, certainly. I have revealed you you to those whom you gave me out of the world they were yours you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word now they know that everything you have given me comes from you for i gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them they knew with certainty that i came from you and they believed that you sent me i pray for them i am not praying for the world but for those you have given me for they are yours all I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. 
for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Wow. <laughs> mm. I'm sorry, but <laughs> this is incredible, isn't it? These are Jesus's words, mm. He's praying. It's an incredible, intimate thing that we're listening to or, you know, reading. Jesus praying this incredible prayer. Um, so Lorna, can I ask you to, to read John 17, 20 to 26? This is when Jesus is praying for us ourselves thank okay. you Lorna. yeah i'm praying not only for these disciples but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message i pray that they will all be one just as you and i are one as you are in me father and i am in you and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me i have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May, the experience, uh, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love these whom you have given to me to, to be with me where I am. Then they will see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> that, <laughs> I mean, that, that is the most amazing prayer that we could ever, ever listen to, I think. And knowing who prayed these words is just mind blowing. Absolutely in incredible. And he did this um, just after the, the, the Last Supper. And it's just amazing to know that his thoughts are about us, his disciples, and about us um, on this incredible night, knowing what's gonna happen the next few hours and yet his focus is making sure that god the father knows about us asking for his love and protection and giving us everything that we need to be able to be the people that we are uh it's just absolutely incredible i i there's no words to say how wonderful this is of showing how jesus loves us so much so it is significant, isn't it, that Jesus died at Passover, which was the time that many lambs would be sacrificed and eaten in the remembrance of what God did for them coming out of Egypt. And also that many thousands would be in Jerusalem at that time to witness what was going to happen to Jesus, as he then would become the ultimate Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus fulfilled the law. So Malcolm, can I ask you just to read one verse, uh, Matthew 5, 17, please? Sure. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Matthew 5, 17, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Yes. This is exactly what Jesus did at that time, at that Passover, where he was taken to the cross, where he was crucified. And on the third day, he arose. He came to fulfill the law. And now no other sacrifice is ever needed once a person accepts him as their Lord and Saviour. That's the incredible thing about it, of why Jesus had to do what he did. So that no other sacrifice is ever, ever needed once a person accepts him as their Lord and Saviour. 
So now I'd like to ask us if we can take communion together. So I'm just going to um, ask the Lord to bless these emblems. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our Lord and Saviour, and we thank you that you went to the cross, Lord. You carried that cross and walked to the place where you're going to be nailed and sacrificed on our behalf, where your body was broken and your blood flowed freely. So, Lord, as we take the bread and we take the wine, we ask, Lord, that you continue to bless us, forgive us our daily sins, Lord, and pray that we would be more focused on you tomorrow than we were today, that we would learn more about you tomorrow than we have today. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we will walk that walk that you want us to walk on and that you will provide everything that we need to be able to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we remember that on that night, he took the bread and broke it and said, eat and do this in remembrance of me. And then he passed the cup and he said, drink this. This is my blood spilt for you. Remission of sins. So we do this in remembrance. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Over to you. Muted. You're muted, Tim. Some people prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's for one, certainly my son would. <laughs> um, John, I just want to thank you. That's um a wonderful start to this uh, this journey as we lead up to, to Easter. Um, I think everybody's contribution is really valuable at uh, these sessions, and I believe we all have something to, to bring from time to time. Um, but at the same time, we're very blessed by, you know, having scholars amongst us. There's a number of people who have studied, you know, theology, and it's very interesting and... Um, to hear them debate, you know, I was listening on the periphery, but just really getting a lot of food from the conversation, you know, that was had earlier. So thank you for those who have shared. I felt also just personally tonight, you know, when I read um, that prayer for believers, you know, that Jesus prayed, um, you know, as you read it, and we, as, or as you heard the words that, uh, you know, Lorma spoke um, or read, I mean, they were written, you know, for us. Yeah. They still feel like they were written. There was an emotion behind them. As, as they were read, I could really feel that being applied to my life. And isn't it wonderful, you know, how that just, you know, for me, again, it just demonstrates how alive and how relevant, you know, God's word is to us personally, you know, um, this day. So, you know, a real wonderful and blessed evening for me tonight. And I hope that others who shared in it received and got as much as, as I did. So thank you, John, for um, being the vessel that brought it to us this evening. 